right. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, commenting in the chat box. We have people from literally all around, um, all around the world and really excited about all the experiences that everyone is bringing with them um, to the workshop. All right. So just uh, perhaps two sentences about Bridge 47 for those who don't know us. There might be a few people who don't, so, uh, but I will be very brief, I promise, and then we go straight to the point. Um, so Bridge 47 uh, is a network of educators, policy specialists, researchers, activists, artists, and others from all around the world who believe in the power of transformative learning as laid out in the target uh, 4.7 of the SDGs. It's also a project that was built by 15 European and global civil society organizations and funded by the EU. So what we do, as you can see on the screen, quite plenty, uh, we advocate for more resources and spaces for uh, transformative learning to take uh, place in communities around the world. We reflect on and push for educational practices to get more innovative, or maybe a better word would be transformative. And we build partnerships with sometimes rather usual, sometimes rather usual and sometimes more unusual uh, suspects as well. All right, but without too much, um, too much uh, ado, uh, we can go to the point. So the agenda for today, we will be together until uh, 4.15 uh, UTC plus one. Uh, we will have some nice presentations from our side, presenting some learnings and experiences that we had with using games for uh, learning. But also, we will be very happy to hear from you what kind of experiences you are bringing uh, to the group and uh, hear more from you, uh, both in the plenary and in the breakouts. And we will wrap up by 4.15, if that is okay with everyone. All right, uh, feel free to comment in the chat box, to discuss in the chat box. Uh, you can also put your questions there. We will take them later on after the discussions. Um, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. So the first speaker is Jakub Szalutko. Uh, he's a Bridge 47 national officer and the GC lead for Slovak uh, civil society organizations. He believes that games and new technologies can help raise the relevance of transformative education in the 21st century. That's why he has devoted the past couple of years facilitating partnerships in the game development and GC ecosystems. All right, uh, Jakub, um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Thanks, Alan. Hi, everybody. Let me share my screen and my presentation real quick. Am I on? Yes. Good is. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to get right to it. In Bridge 47, we have developed our own little game, which we'll present later. But firstly, I guess a bit of intro to why we have been exploring potential of games in education and what actually this potential is according to us and according to some research that has already been done. I'll be talking about what games bring to the table in the realm of education, what are some of, let's say, games with educational potential, and then uh, I'll tell you a bit about the game that we have developed together with Barbara from Open Lab. She'll present a bit later, so let me get right to it. So why games in education? Um, I have six aspects of games, uh, or six things that games bring to the table. The first one is uh, basically flow. I, I hope uh, many of you are gamers. I hope many of you have experienced this. So real life can be a bit dull, can be a bit challenging, a bit boring at times, which is all good, but uh, games provide us with an interesting tool um, that can 
that can foster motivation, inner motivation. Uh, it gives us the ability to kind of uh, interact with a uh, with something that that we can solve. Uh, games are not unsolvable, so so that is uh, that is something that that creates flow in people and can be used in education, in my view, um, quite well because you know that uh, nowadays in learning we have too many distractions uh, that kind of lead away from the learning process. So games do foster that concentration. Um, games do provide some happiness value or, or, or how to put this. Uh, basically, they, they can make us feel happy uh, and they raise the quality of our life. Um, it is a philosophical uh, point, uh, which I'm not going to get deep into and you can comment whenever you want to. Uh, in the chat, if you disagree, we can take that up after my presentation. But games um, basically make us happy just by us playing the games. Uh, they are very sustainable tools through which we can kind of raise our level of satisfaction in life. Um, we do not need, you know, material and extrinsic rewards uh, like new phones, new clothes, new cars, new stuff. Games make us kind of have flow and enjoy ourselves just by playing them. So um, that is a that is a good thing. They also give us a chance to to um, be part of something bigger, which basically means uh, be parts of communities playing games. Uh, there have been games designed solely on creating such communities, like you know, esport game. Uh, you know, multiplayer games, which have created, you know, multi-million communities of people who meet in and out of game, as you can see, uh, they, they foster real life relationships. Um, they give us the sense of belonging some, some, somewhere, especially in terms of introverts, games are oftentimes a, a very good way for, for them to, to uh, get their community and get their tribe. Um, close to that and, and in relation to that is another aspect of games. And they're, they're most of the time, they're epic. So not only you are part of, 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 uh, of a community, but you do have big goals. It's, it's all part of a big story. And we as educators and, you know, people using global citizenship education, other, other value-based transformative education approaches are uh, trying to transfer and trying to, you know, uh, pass on different narratives from the one mainstream narrative that we are living in today. Uh, and games are a, a very good tool to do that. Um, to what extent this is used is 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 a good question, but they certainly games certainly provide us space to pass on our messages and to pass on the narrative and create communities, and if you want to go crazy, even movements of people belonging to a community, living a certain narrative. Um, right, the five, the fifth thing, the fifth added value. Uh, games uh, bring to the table is is just simply uh, developing skills, knowledge, and competencies of of the players. Um, some games are designed to do this more than others, but um, you know there is this theory that uh, if a person spends ten thousand hours doing something, you know, playing violin or jumping with Super Mario, he or she develops a skill uh, of playing a violin or having a a good reflexes in controlling Mario. But games can certainly develop other skills, whether it's um, managerial skills or, or being able to uh, react to changing environment or to experiment or to basically learn the rules and, and, and kind of play according to rules. Uh, they do, many games do have a kind of knowledge-based narratives and knowledge-based gameplay, so they are 
uh, developed uh, according to historical circumstances that gamers just live through and therefore learn about them. And least, last but not least, they do foster uh, competences. So many games, as I will mention uh, in a minute or two, do talk about global issues and, and do kind of position uh, players into being able to decide, being able to evaluate, uh, you know, trends and different issues and challenges that are in the games, but also in our real lives. And then games are a safe space for experimentation and finding solutions to real world issues. Uh, here is the screenshot of a game. It's called uh, City Skylines, if I'm not mistaken. And this game has been used by a lot of city planners. So this has been used by city of Stockholm. This should be a picture of Stockholm. Um, it's been used by Stockholm to um, simulate how people would interact with different uh, planning strategies of the city. So you can build, uh, build a city, deploy traffic and people in it and see how they would interact and how they would react to what you do in the city. So this is a safe way for cities to experiment as well as for people to kind of see what would happen. Right, so to sum it up, um, games do have a lot of positive aspects. They do foster motivation. They, they can bring happiness in terms of uh, having us achieve relevant goals. Uh, they give us and can foster time spent with friends, give us the feeling of, of being part of something bigger and something grand, or being part of a story and narrative and build our skills, knowledge, and give us space to experiment. So that's that's positive sides of games. And that's why we, in Bridge 47, went on this journey. Uh, but before I, I show you where we came to, uh, I'm going to show you where other people have, have, have come to and what games are there that kind of exemplify what I have been talking about. Uh, so. I labeled them educational games, but it's it's up for us to decide whether they are educational. So the first one, uh, you probably have been familiar with the stereotype uh, of games making people violent, of war games making people violent, killing each other, uh, competing. Um, there are these types of games, and I'm not going to go into deconstructing the, the stereotypes. But this is a war game which kind of takes uh, or looks at a different uh, side of the story of, of wars. Uh, so you play as a civilian in a conflict. You play as a group of civilians in a conflict and you kind of have to survive as a civilian in conflict. So you have to look after your comrades. You, you have to look after your Food. You have to look after your psychological state and well, not happiness, but at least normalcy. You have to basically survive as a civilian. It's a very impactful game. I, I was able to play it for six hours and then uh, never really been able to return because it's, it's tough. It really shows you uh, the other side of, of wars. Um, another game about wars. Uh, is Attentat 1942, uh, which basically shows stories of Holocaust, Holocaust survivors. It's been made by Charles University Studios. And it's again a, a very good example of how historical events can be gamified and shown in an interactive way. Now, uh, Minecraft, you probably know Minecraft. Uh, it's been all around for years now. And I'm showing it because uh, approximately two years ago, I found out that around 60 people have, have uh, created a server in Minecraft where they have all built their own kind of state. And they all built uh, different states, uh, states uh, functioning according to different, let's say, ideologies or different sets of rules 
So there was a communist state, anarchist, not really state, anarchist community, libertarian state, uh, capitalist state, and they were simulating how, how it would work in different settings. So Minecraft is a, is a vast opportunity to experiment with different things um, with other people and not really needing to have much to do it. Um, next example is Journey, which is a very immersive game, an example of how games can kind of consume you emotionally and, and drive you through a journey. So it's a, it's a very short game, so it doesn't make you addicted or anything, but it, it, it just gets you in and you play with one other person you meet online, you don't know their name, you don't know anything about them, you cannot talk to them, and you basically go on a journey to that mountain you see on the screen. And what it does is just, it shows you the, the beauty of, of meditation, of, of, of peace of mind and, and calm. So games can do that too. Another example, I have three more. Another example is Frostpunk. Um, uh, funky sounding game, but what it does is it's, it, it uh, brings a player to, a, to an environment where climate catastrophe has, has, has come. Uh, the world got frozen and there is 200 people left on Earth. And basically, you, you are in charge of those people. You have to survive uh, managing a community in challenging circumstances. And what the game really is about is the decisions you make uh, about the sick people, about uh, political setting that you create, uh, whether you, uh, you know, build an authoritarian state or whether you build a let's say, more liberal state uh, or community. It again uh, teaches people uh, the importance of, of political decisions and their uh, consequences. Uh, then games uh, can also uh, be a good place or a good, good uh, tool to kind of make sense of your surroundings, of your uh, you know, regions or states, uh, they can build or tell alternative histories and they can, they can share uh, past narratives and stories of people who have lived in your, in your area. Kentucky Road Zero does that for Kentucky in the US. Uh, I've played through it and it's again, very similar to Journey. It's a, it's a very interesting story. And you really get a sense of knowing Kentucky and, and how, how fun this place is just by playing, playing the game. Um, this game called Never Alone is a bit different. Um, you play as this little girl and her uh, white fox. Uh, and you basically play, um, if you played Super Mario, so you jump around uh, on platforms. But what this game does is it along the way it tells you the story of uh, of a tribe from I think North Canada and this tribe of um, Eskimo people has been slowly disappearing because you know people the young people born in this tribe are are slowly moving to cities. So the game has been developed by this by this community by this nation and kind of just. Uh, uh, creates a heritage of, of a culture which is disappearing, so it will stay with us even after they either disappear or the game supports their uh, further existence. Um, I'm going to jump through this one. Um, and I wanted to talk about one more game, which is basically a platform uh, where you can design more games. So uh, in a game called Dreams, uh, the players do not only uh, play games, but they are encouraged to use the different graphical assets, to create their own games, and to share those with, with uh, friends and with the community for them to play. So it's a game fostering creativity and game development, basically. So creating the whole ecosystem for 
developing and playing games. I have two more games, very similar for you, which I have called activist games. But what they do is that contrary to, uh, again, a bit stereotypical opinion that games just freeze you uh, in front of screens, uh, you probably met Pokemon Go, uh, maybe some of you have experienced Pokemon Go. It's a, it's a huge phenomenon with uh, a lot of shown potential of how games can bring people actually to the streets and, and give them space to explore their surrounding environment and to meet people. When I studied at university, one of my uh, schoolmates actually met her boyfriend through playing Pokemon Go. So these are all people catching Pokemon. Uh, and Minecraft is uh, obviously uh, trying to uh, design something similar. So technologies like augmented reality and virtual reality make uh, games into something potentially, again, quite interesting for educational purposes. Um, where in education can games be used? Um, the games that I mentioned, probably most of all in informal and non-formal education, and in, let's say, value-based education or global citizenship education, so in our community. But then I think uh, there is a use case for games in, in classroom. Uh, I think they are being designed and they should be designed as, as following curricula and, and helping teachers actually teach what they have to teach, either in classroom through homeworks or, or through extracurricular activities. So I think Jakub, sorry. an education is there. One or two minutes, uh, if okay. that's okay. Sorry, yeah, that's okay. have to be the That's post. okay. Thanks, Alan. One or two minutes for this or we can start with Realtopia now. Oh, okay. Okay, you were just at ending. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, no problem. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for giving us so many ideas for uh, spending winter holidays in lockdown. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So we're going to be sending you the presentation after the after the event, right? Excellent. Uh, everyone, please feel free. Some people have already recognized some of the games uh, that were presented. Feel free to comment. Feel free to add ideas, questions. We will pick on them. Um, and uh, we will now go on to how to even start thinking about games. How did it go with our uh, uh, game and our experience with, with uh, conceptualization? Please, uh, Jakub. The floor is yours again. Thank you. Yeah, I have five minutes of voice and then I'm out. So bear with me. Okay, so this is our experience. This is where we got inspired by all what, I, what I've shown you. We created this little game uh, in the open lab, uh, Accelerator. It's a game created by students, basically for students. And I'm going to show you what the story here is. Um, so in the game, you kind of find yourself in a community of a few hundred people, which has survived the ecological crisis of 21st, 21st century. And um, you are left with technologies and with research and with people and some um, ideas on how to how to warn people living in the year 2020 about what they not what they should not be doing, how they should be looking after the earth, and how they should be acting not to destroy it. So, your mission in the game is to um, basically explore the environment. Uh, collect materials, um, build your own kind of city or build your own community, which would then create, and here goes the, the 
fancy part, so which community the community would create a time traveling machine, which would then be able to send messages from the future, from the destroyed future to the past, warning people that if they do not change their behavior, it will lead to a, a destruction of Earth. So you do it this way. You start with a few kind of machines operated by these few people left on Earth who basically collect materials, uh, explore the area, look for little snippets of, um, you know, advice, little snippets of the narrative and of the kind of GCE messages, which they would then send to the past. And in the end, you get an opportunity to stop playing and send this message to the past, so to the year 2020, warning people that they need to change. Or you get, a, get an option to continue playing and basically you don't give people in 2020 another chance to change. So this is kind of the, the high point of the game where you have to decide uh, which course or, or how you want history to continue. And this is the kind of the learning point, uh, which can then be talked about in classrooms with, with kids at home, uh, wherever you can think about morals and ethics of PC. Right. And we did this with our awesome partners from OpenLab. And I think uh, I'm going to leave it here. You got the link for the game. Um, and we will discuss the presentation in a few minutes. But first, I think Barbara is, is next up. Thank you, Jakob. Thanks a lot. Uh, as it was already announced, so the next one, the next presentation will be from Barbara Rusinakova, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, who is an executive manager of Open Lab. Um, after studying and working in Denmark and the USA, she returned to Slovakia, where she helped build educational program for high school students focused on ac acquiring tech and soft skills. Barbara, uh, Feel free to kick off. Thank you very much, Alan. And I'm very pleased to be able to be here with you today and share some of our experience from what we do and how we approach education in general and especially in connection with, uh, with games. So uh, yes, as you said, uh, I am a leading um, organization uh, called OpenLab, which is designed to uh, change the way we teach IT at high schools. Um, we have basically partnered with uh, companies, uh, the tech companies in Slovakia, who felt the need to increase the quality of our education system, especially with focus on tech and soft skills. Uh, so basically, we are trying to um, improve or Put the focus on social development, on learning uh, via practical experience, and also accelerating talents. So far, we are actually working with 150 students in 10 labs in two cities, one of which is uh, the capital Bratislava and one of uh, which is located in north of Slovakia uh, called Kisutske Nove Mesto. Uh, the idea of the wall open lab is that we are partnering with tech companies. Each company has uh, its own lab focused on the tech, um, um, tech um, segment, which they are uh, leaders in. So that's why we have the hybrid, hybrid lab focused on uh, developing uh, hybrid app applications. We have the games lab, the apps lab, IoT lab. So this is the way how we hope to in, make more labs in the future with, with other companies. Uh, what is this approach maybe special about? Um, 
we take pride in saying we are special because we managed to infiltrate the formal education system. So we actually replace some of the lessons the students have uh, in the uh, total of five hours per week. We have a person called lab master, uh, which is the uh, professional from the field that is, um, is being selected by the company that we co cooperate with. Uh, we also create some materials, teaching materials focused on IT, which uh, we are really lacking here in Slovakia. And we develop real projects, uh, one of which is exactly the Realtopia. So one uh, team consisting of three students uh, was focusing on, on developing this game. And the whole idea of partnership and the partnership and collaboration, that is something which I believe is pretty uh, usual uh, these days. Uh, in the Western world, but still here in Slovakia and maybe some other countries around us, uh, we are still uh, kind of struggling with uh, innovating our education system. That's why for us, um, having the idea of partnership at school is still pretty novel. So this is how our school year look like. Just to give you an idea, in September, we select the students. Uh, first couple of months, they acquire tech skills by learning uh, specific areas that they choose. So in our, uh, in our case, where students were uh, creating a game, uh, the team was consisting of the programmer, of the graphics, and also the, the game designer. So they were kind of uh, getting the basic tech skills needed for creating a game. Then uh, towards the half of the school year, they uh, start working on projects. And via that, they acquire many soft skills. And at the end, um, we have something called Open Gate, which is like the public presentation of the, of the game. Uh, these are some of the technologies for those of you who are maybe interested and have some idea of, of, the, of the tools uh, that are being used. And this is just to illustrate that we are really trying to work with the latest technologies which are actually being used by the company so the students are ready to join, uh, join the market after, after they finish high school already. And just to illustrate very quickly some uh, examples of the games uh, and applications that have been developed so far, um, maybe one which you can actually try and, and play uh, if you have an Android and go to Google Play is uh, the one in the middle, the Merge mobile phones. It actually, I think the guys got like 50,000 uh, downloads so far. So it's pretty successful for, for uh, young, uh, young students. And also the app uh, here on the right side, uh, we developed that one also in collaboration with an NGO here in Slovakia. It's a car sharing app as they are located in the middle of nowhere and organizing workshops. So our students try to help them. And actually this is the real thing which is working uh, well so far. What is actually the most important and the most interesting uh, for, for, for you, for this audience, is uh, the game Realtopia, as uh, Jakob introduced it. Uh, so we um, gave the students uh, a topic that they could choose. We call it at the very beginning for change. So we had one team who decided that they want to develop a game which is for change. And out of that, we came up with the idea of recycling. Um, and basically the whole process was very much uh, interconnected uh, between the students as the, the team who developed the games and Jakob and his team, the, the kind of the clients who, who presented their ideas and together we try to develop something which is useful, which can serve as an illustration how games can be uh, used and how games can be actually helpful in uh, maybe innovating the education as such. So. Um, while uh, having this uh, connection between the, the clients and the students, our students also had a chance to improve their soft skills. Uh, they had a chance to think and to kind of consider the global impact of their game. They were able to, uh, you know, have, have this opportunity to work with uh, someone real who has uh, an idea and who has uh, uh, requirements for for the game that they are working on and also they uh, have been uh, kind of forced to test their game with their classmates and with uh, people in their environment to make sure the game is easy to play it's it's uh, 
it's uh, um, you know it's kind of people like it and it's kind of uh, joyful as well so uh, from that perspective we in open lab we very much prefer to have real partners as clients for our students because then they got completely different experience and the experience which is real uh, which is kind of waiting for them uh, after they finish the school uh, just to finish it up, uh, to show you that this kind of approach and the games and applications that students uh, create, uh, it, it, it has been recognized by, uh, by uh, our community as well, especially the, the parents who kind of appreciate that their, their kids can already create something useful and something real at, at high school. And maybe just uh, an um, interesting point uh, towards the end of, of the, this short presentation of OpenLab, we try to create digital tools uh, to help not just our students and teachers that we work with, but also all students and all teachers in Slovakia and, and, and abroad as well, um, especially with the platform, the education platform Open Academy, where we put our uh, materials and open academy is also a project uh, created by one of our student team uh, so it's kind of again a connection of of our students need, needing to develop their skills and us having an kind of need for educational platform for instance and also drill it's kind of a tool for online testing which kind of, which kind of helped many uh, students and teachers during uh, the covid uh, covid time uh, just last final remarks, uh, we are really trying to connect students to companies already at high schools and we do that not only by finding clients, so finding real problems that our students can uh, look for, uh, create solutions for us, but also uh, via student internships uh, that we are launching actually, actually now. And this, this is it, very shortly introducing what we do and how come our students created Realtopia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions or if you got interested in any part of it, I will be happy to answer now. Also here are our contacts. So feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Barbara. Very interesting and really happy to have been uh, working with you. Um, all right, now that the official presentations part uh, we have been through. Uh, we have now space for everyone to just raise if they if they have any key questions or key um, key things that struck them, maybe some game that they really liked in the presentation, like feel free to, to raise whatever you feel like. You can do so but write, by writing in the chat box and we will uh, pick on your questions, my colleague Ricarda. Uh, will help me uh, with spotting, or you can raise your hand as well. And please don't be shy, we are all here, proud lifelong learners. Anyone who is brave enough to break the ice? Uh, perhaps some questions about the game itself. Yeah. Christos? Yeah. Can yes, you hear me? feel free. Yes, Perfect. go ahead. Uh, I was wondering at which uh, stage of development the game is and also who is curating the content, like the, the story and the, the ethical um, content that is in the game. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Maybe we can pick one or two more and then we can take them together. Thank you, Christos, for the question and for breaking the ice. Very important. <laughs> and maybe once, uh, since the, the ice is broken, maybe we can answer so that we don't wait for another one. I sure. think the game is at an MVP stage, so it's a minimal viable product. And that has been our kind of our goal to do it, to do it this way. Um, I'm not sure into what stages games in open lab are being developed. Maybe Barbara can share share more mm -hmm. like, stage they can, they can push yeah. in. Um, yeah, normally uh, for us, the priority also is on learning. So we want students, students to go as far as they can, but we don't demand results uh, as long as they are learning. 
uh, with this specific case, as we had a client and we had a commitment to make, uh, we also kind of worked uh, maybe a bit closer with professionals who could support the students in order to make sure that we make it towards the goal, which 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 is which was the MVP. So uh, I would say uh, Realtopia is together with maybe two or three more projects at the final stage uh, where we managed to, 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 to push it. Uh, other projects are normally less developed because students are limited by the number of hours and the time. And also the COVID made it a little bit harder to, to work and to be close and, and progress. But I would say uh, from what I have seen so far, uh, working uh, two and a half years in Open Lab, uh, this team particularly make it pretty far and they actually work also during the holidays to finish up some, some sounds and other things which normally we don't really focus on. And the narrative aspect has been uh, developed, co-developed also with Bridge 47 staff. So Timo, me and Gillian and Christina from Bridge 47, we've been involved in developing the narrative yeah thank you anyone else anything to add hi hello hi Patricia. hi i would just uh, like to um elaborate please jacob more for others uh, to understand um when you, when you said that there was a, there was a whole team working on the story, but do you think that there there's a, was a different approach uh, because of your knowledge of the GCE prior than uh, you know, that would be approach for other gamers? Maybe uh, also question for Barbara. If this is you know if, if you can see any difference in creating um, a game that brings or hopefully brings to a social change in behavior. Or is it? It's just. It's not just for fun, right? Thank you. Maybe I can just say one remark. Um, as I'm working very closely with uh, game developer studios, uh, normally I would say that for them the profit is number one uh, target, right? If if they don't make the profit, they cannot make more games, and and the whole cycle of the company is interrupted. So. I think um, um, studios which are being privately funded are not going to think uh, via a social cause, uh, but they will try to build a business model which works as a first priority. What I, what, what I believe uh, we could move towards is that right the second priority after the first one is met will be the social cause. Uh, because right now we see it very much that the social, uh, that the, the, the profit as such is the one and the only priority. Uh, so I really kind of feel there is a space between connecting the social aspect of the, the social impact of the games with the profit side of, of the creation. Uh, so that's what I hope we will move towards. But uh, having the team which is uh, kind of sensitive towards the social social costs uh, made uh, made it also easier for our students to have the narrative that they can kind of uh, move towards. So uh, that that helped us a lot, and I think it was also very helpful for students that they showed them that we can think through social costs as a first priority. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Barbara. Timo, you wanted to add something? Yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> maybe just um, adding to what Patricia and, and uh, has um, just asked about the, um, the GCE specific approach here and also what Christos has been asking about the ethics of the game. I think for us, the biggest challenge was that the the basic mechanics of the game was about recycling and using technology um, to build something, right? And um, that is, well, certainly something that, that GCE is advocating for to recycle more, but at the same time, um, it's really not the message, the political message that we want to, to, to bring about. So our challenge was, is how can we build a narrative around these mechanics that actually has a stronger political 
message and that does not suggest that if we just re all recycle a little more and eat a little more organic food and consume a little less then this will get out us out of the mess that we have created for ourselves but that we need more profound changes and yet that everybody has a role in it and that even though this is very complex and overwhelming uh, we can all do little things and uh, yeah we, we try to do our best to both create the general narrative around it and then sneak little messages in that are a bit politicizing and empowering in that way and uh, yeah you, you might tell us if, if we manage to do so <laughs> um, or not yeah thank you thank you Timo maybe that's a maybe that's a good uh, way to to wrap up this part but we do still want to hear from you uh, all the all the great ideas or experiences or both that you might have so uh, we'd really like to take your uh, to pick up on your on, on, on such ideas from your side so in the next part we'll have 20 minutes for for smaller group more intimate discussions and just some uh, free exchanges again please don't feel uh, too pressured about it it's just a very informal casual chat about um, okay what what is the potential what what is what are the what is the potential and what are the um, uh, challenges of using games for learning and education and uh, what are some interesting examples of games you might have used for learning and in uh, education. So there will be groups of uh, four. I will sh I will share uh, Jamboard with you. There will be no reporting, so no pressure about writing everything super in detail and finding a reporter in the group or anything like that. But it would be nice to collect in a way your ideas. So uh, if you notice some potential or challenges or some examples of games you would like to share, experiences you have, you can just uh, put post-its, virtual post-its there uh, by adding here sticky notes. And there is also one important one for future cooperation networking. So if you would like to stay in touch, you can also leave your contact details in the right column. And here are the, the names of the groups. You will be assigned to so group one and here you can go to group two group three so you can go to your slide and add whatever you feel like sharing with other groups so you can uh, refer to other people's groups uh, experiences as well even after the event okay if uh, that is clear technical wise uh, i will share the link to jamboard and if you can just give me uh, one second to uh, split you into groups, that would be great. All right. All right, I will let you know once it's two minutes or three minutes before uh, the time is up. And enjoy the discussions. Ellen, do you want to pause the recording? Mm -hmm.